So good afternoon, everybody. Today is July 27th. We are going to be going over lesson two of the breakthrough agent. What's it called? Next level agent. Anybody remember where we left off? Next level training. And I think we're on page 11. Okay. Um, the value of a lead. You know, <laughs> I'm going to skip over that one. Uh, <laughs> all right. Um, we were on page 11. Okay. Actually, you know what? I don't know if we really went into page 10. So why don't we start at prospecting activities? I know we went over, when we finished last time, we talked about a, a active and passive ways to market and prospect. Um, give me a couple examples of an active ways to prospect. Anybody? Door knocking. Door knocking? What else is another active way of prospecting? Phone calls. Phone calls? Okay. What's a passive way of marketing? Mailers, name badge, it's another good one. Um, Elizabeth, hey, I see you wearing your name badge. <laughs> I, I was inspired by Lincoln's experience. And so now both of these young ladies got leads because they had their name badge on. I'm telling you, and I'm not a, a good example right now. So, uh, right? So that's awesome, those are wins. Actually, before I get started, does anybody have any wins for the week they want to share? I know Ben came in and had one. Um, anything happen in their business that they want to share? That was a win. I do, if you guys can hear me. Noah, go for it, and then we'll jump to Linda. Go for it. Um, okay, I had uh, a lead who wouldn't even, an internet lead who wouldn't even text me back. I could never get him on the phone. I'm meeting with him Friday um, to possibly sign a buyer's agreement. I pitched it to him, and he's up for the idea. I also had uh, picked up a lead on a listing um, yesterday, and a, another lead for a buyer that I'm meeting with her tomorrow to show her a property. You had a, uh, that's been a pretty busy week. Nice job. Um, the internet lead that you had to follow up with, what, what finally tipped the scale to get him to call you back? Um, he wouldn't, I told him, I finally, uh, was very candid with him and stopped trying to kiss his ass, um, to not, you know, to put it blatant. I, uh, I just told him, look, there are things preventing me from being able to work a hundred percent for you. Um, I'm not going to dig into things with, as far as like lending. If I don't know there's light at the end of the tunnel, there's red flags and the fact I can't call you or get questions answered. Um, I'm not going to do my job half ass. So if you're serious about this, please give me a call. Um, otherwise I'll keep sending you stuff. Let me know if you want to see some. And, uh, he goes, yeah, give me a call tomorrow after two. So I called him. I told him, uh, look, I expect from my clients that they sign with me knowing that if I find you something, you're not going to go dump it off to your sister. And he said, no, I understand. My dad and I are buying the house. Let me talk to my dad. I sent him over lenders. He's meeting with lenders today and tomorrow, and then we're clicking up tomorrow. Good job, nice. So everything you just said is awesome, minus the cursing. Let's try to yeah. figure out how to change the vocabulary. <laughs> minus the cursing, but everything you just did. Well, it was a very long. It was a very long message, and I was very polite through the whole thing. And I that was my ending sentence. Was, <laughs> was my ending sentence? Actually, I have it in front of me. Was. Um, was it costs you nothing for me to go to bat for you, but I won't do my job half-assed because our communication is bad. And did you write that down before you called? So you had that script. Is that why I'm hearing you said it's in front of you? I sent that as a text okay. um, because he would not answer my calls. And I told him I would rather have this phone, rather have this as a phone call than over a text, but gotcha. I can't get a hold of him. Is there script reading help in this? Uh, yes, yes. Script reading has helped me a lot. Um, Linda, th thank you, Noah. That's awesome. Yeah, Linda, you said you had a win. Uh, yeah, we have one in escrow, and uh, my listing went live on the MLS. 
one in escrow and a listing went live as well. So you had you had two wins. You had two wins. It's a nice job. Ben, do you want to share your potential win? Yeah, you know what? It just kind of evolved. It felt on me when my customers had called and I was in the middle of doing something else. He was looking for a five dollar part. And I was I part of me wanted to say, hey, you know what? They have my Walmart. So I, like, <laughs> you know, walk up there and get it. I'm focused, trying to focus. So I said, you know what? Just treat every customer like a trust customer. And um, I took someone to come on my house. I told what I was doing, he came on my house, handed him the part. And then I also had another one of my, my new business cards and told them I was doing real estate now. And um, he said, yeah, you know, I want to sell my house. So that kind of evolved and opened up into um, a potential listing. And um, yeah, he wants to sell his house now that he owns outright with cash and go buy a new house for 800 grand. So it kind of, I'm like, oh, that sounds too good to be true there. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's, you know it's, and it's, just, it's part of, um, I think just because I had a prior, I sold the boat, I had a relationship already established. But um, a little hiccup that I did run into that I kept quiet, so I'm listening to them, and we'll continue to listen more and learn more about Robert Fisher and his strategies. Because the second he brought up Robert Fisher's name, it kind of it kind of just made me go, hmm, okay, what's what's Robert doing that we need to be aware of so that when you go in front of you know a, a seller that you have some arsenal. You know, to go up against Robert's strategy in without more than half percent. Your language and your vocabulary right now, and the way you just describe that, is perfect. It, what he does, it's different, and what we're doing is different. And there's nothing wrong with any which way. It's we need to show value in what we do differently to get you top dollar, to get you more exposure than our competition but not to bad mouth or bring down competition, just we do business differently. He's doing it this way and to understand all of your competitors and what they do, it gives you that extra leverage that you need when you're at the table going, I understand who did you sit down with? Oh, you sat down with ABC company. You know exactly what their presentation was. Therefore you have your arsenal ready to, you know, fight and, and, show what you do that's better than them, or what you do is different. Lesson five covers the listing presentation. So those are awesome wins. Uh, Elizabeth? Is that what the 315 is? Yeah, Is that what the 315 is? Yes. Okay. Okay, am I going or are we just meeting? I'd like to go, but it's up to you. Okay. Okay, well, we'll talk at 3.15. Thank you for booking that appointment. I'll see you at 3.15. Cool. All right, so with that said, um, prospecting activities. There are three types of activities where you should invest your time. Income-producing activities. So just know your time is valuable. Um, weigh out how much time you want to put into projects and, and activities. Income-producing, 50% of your time should be spent on activities that are obviously income-producing. So prospecting, door knocking, phone cabinetsing, calling for sale by owners, calling expireds, um, sphere of influence on activities, target marketing, and attending local events. You can't call expired anymore? You cannot use the MLS as the source to be able to call expireds, but Mojo Dialer is still a third party company that sells that, so I have a buffer which means I did not use the MLS to get my source that these are expired. And therefore I'm not violating the rule that says, and until car tells me I can't call, I'm not violating the matrix rule. Matrix says you can't use the matrix. That's fine. I won't use the matrix to get my source. I'll use Mojo Dialer. I'll use third party companies. How will they even police on uh, how I present it to you when I'm on camera is how they police it. So if I sit here and tell you jump on the matrix and pull up expireds and I want you to call on those, then my brokerage is going to be liable because I'm teaching you that. I'm not teaching you to use the matrix as a source. I'm teaching you to get creative on maybe you're watching a property and all of a sudden it's off realtor.com. Well, you're not calling to say, did your house, you know, did your house expire? I saw your house expired. You'd be calling to say, you're no longer on these websites, what's going on? Hey, Mr. Owner, I don't see that you're listing your property for sale anymore, why not? 
And now you're just trying to get the information and you're not using the matrix as the source that it expired. What they are trying to fight and stop is the 40, 50 phone calls because they instantly see it on matrix and they open up their hot sheet and they say, Oh, five expired today. And that's, but if you can get creative on finding other sources that figure out why, like maybe a for sale sign came down and that's the reason why you're reaching out. You're not reaching out because it's expired. You're reaching out because it's no longer on the market and you're trying to figure out, are they still open to selling their house? What happened and why it didn't it sell? Totally different. And I can stand behind that and I will stand behind that and I will go to arbitration with the board and fight that all tooth and nail until they come with a, crystal clear guideline of what I can and can't do. Um, yeah. My, excuse me, my flip flow is for sale loan on my part. We typically sell it once they come in and it was a buyer. So mine never get multiple. So is that when uh, pending or whatever, I can't remember what it's all or it does, but then progressive agents have a good default. So that's what I would pick them up for, not them a lot. Sure. Oh yes, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Hey Rick, Rick, please come up. Actually, can I get Rick to come up? Uh, there you go. You gotta stand here. All right, everybody. This is Rick. Rick is. Well, so that's what uh, I look like. Okay, that's what you look like. Rick is new to the company. He is actually an employee with the company, and he is going to maintain and manage our recruiting efforts, our growth efforts. Um, we haven't really came up with a good title. It's like over the top, um, but it'll be a very impressive title when we come impressive. up. Impressive. It's gonna be we'll awesome. Put that on the. Uh, yeah. So actually, Rick, I'm doing all that. Yourself and, uh, yeah. Take a few minutes. Yeah, my name is Rick Ledbetter, and I reside in Orchid. And I used to do what you guys were doing years ago, and then I did some mortgage lending, and I've been out of that. Um, I was semi-retired. I was telling Bob, broker Bob. Uh, that semi-retirement didn't work too well, so I need to get back into something. And um, uh, real estate offices, I always really liked a lot of a lot of dynamic energy, what have you. Uh, and then after meeting David, uh, I thought this might be an interesting position. I don't have an interest to get my license back. That's expired years ago, but something ancillary. And I think this could be really exciting with his his ideas and um, uh, energy. So, uh, are you are you who's new? in here as far as agents. Okay, so, so yeah, yeah. Well, when I started out, we didn't get a whole lot of help. Um, and it's nice to have someone you can go to. Uh, so I'm pretty impressed with that. So anyway, so I'm working right now uh, 10 to three during the days, so. 10 to three, we're gonna be hammer around and. Oh, no. I think it's only one day a week, but uh, hey, I'm gonna be exhausted after that. This is one day a week. Oh, this is one. <laughs> nice way to keep the head in the game. What'd you do with your context? Do you want to sell it? <laughs> okay, so Rick, we are very excited to have you. Um, we're going to be working together and just figure out where this goes and where we can take it. Um, initially, I'd also like to introduce Celine. Celine is our virtual receptionist, virtual assistant on the back end. She started yesterday. Um, and what she's doing is maintaining our database and actually start doing customer service calls. And then she'll actually start farming territories to see if I can generate leads that get distributed out to you guys as well. So she started yesterday. Um, and then we are interviewing for one other position, um, possibly for the, about next month is what we're looking for. So anyway, that's a side note. Let's stick to the game plan here. Um, Things that are profitable to do, so prospecting, door knocking, phone calls. I mean, this is a contact sport. You have to make contact. 25% um, 20, of your time should be spent on activities that are like preparing for your daily goals, writing down ads, promoting open houses, sending thank you cards, developing direct mail flyers. Actually, Deb, there's a direct mailer flyer or a flyer right there. Can you grab that? And then looking on the MLS for inventory. So you want to make sure that you're not tinkering too much. And this is comes down to every Sunday, like planning out and time blocking and going, all right, one hour of my day is going to be here. And if that's one hour, then that means three hours are going to be for the, the income producing stuff. Um, if a project you're like, I'm gun ho about starting a campaign, 
you still don't want to focus all your time on getting that campaign campaign started then all of a, it's right there right there look down you don't see anything on the ground no okay um you don't want to spend all your time building this campaign because then all of a sudden you'll pull from the income producing stuff and you'll find that it's you're ha you're gonna have to start over again to start building up your pipeline so if you get consistent in what you do even if your campaign takes a week instead of getting it all done in two days it spreads out over a week well the stuff that is income producing you're spending your time doing that in that week also by the end of the week you'll have made some pipeline stuff and your campaign will end up finishing itself so it's like it's planning it out that every day i'm going to do a little bit in my campaign and by the end of the week i'm going to have my campaign done that is time blocking yourself if you don't do that you're going to find you'll be doing a lot of busy work you'll be shooting by the hip and then all of a sudden you're wondering why I don't have any business and then you're focusing on income producing and you've just wasted a good two weeks on a project that you could have spread out over time and yeah. So just monitor that very carefully. It, it happens all the time, even, even for me right now still, um, I get caught up in the busy work. Yeah. Um, practicing your prospecting dialogue and scripts. The only reason you wanna do that is so when you're on Somebody asks you a question, you have your dialogue ready to go. You have your arsenal ready to go on how you're going to um, answer something. And how are you going to handle the objection? Um, if you need help with that, 8.30 in the morning, we have script reading every morning at 8.30. So if you're able to get on that, uh, every day it's a different category. You can get on the back of the website and find out what that category is. Today was uh, door knocking. We went over door knocking techniques. Me, Celine, and Trina were going over door knocking techniques. And Trina went, oh my God, I just had that happen. Let me write down what a good way to say that is. And she, she was able to pull from that. Um, coming to these training classes definitely helps because it gets, it gets you in the mode, like Ben said, somebody came over and he handed them the business card. You know, it's getting in that sort of mindset. Um, MLS meetings on Friday are a good source, a good wealth of information. So the more information that you're able to talk about real estate, the more your clients are gonna feel that you are the trusted advisor, that you know what you're doing. Um, I love that Ben today told his client, this is gonna be my first listing, but that also means that I'm gonna focus 100% of my efforts on you. This is a big deal for me to give me an opportunity to show you what I can do. From what I heard, your client appreciated that where it's, hey, I'm not gonna throw you in this machine. You are my one and only number one client right now. I'm gonna go above and beyond and bend backwards to make sure that you are happy because I wanna get my foot in the door and I need help. And in order, you know, give me an opportunity and let me show you what I can do. Um, people love, people have no problem doing that. The moment they know you have support too. That's what's gonna also seal the deal is like, dude, I know you're new, but you have a plethora of support. Your team, you, you guys as a group are gonna be able to handle this and you're always gonna be the face of the business. You're gonna be the point guy. Um, attend real estate conventions and training seminars. With that said, there is Tom Ferry that's coming up. Yes, I'm gonna go. Yes, I'm gonna bring stuff back, but what I get from it might be different from what you get from it. And I can't tell you how many, they have classes, trainings, uh, seminars. They have a whole itinerary of what they're gonna be teaching on. Um, why am I able to stand up here and feel confident to talk to a group of 100 or 50 or just general public? It's because over the last decade, I've been going to seminars and trainings and conferences and learning real estate behind the scenes. And it's those type of functions in Texas and all these other places we would go to that gave me the knowledge and the confidence to be able to be up here. Um, so I can't stress enough that to this day, I'm still going to those conferences because this industry is changing on a daily basis. And the biggest hurdle people say is, well, I don't have the money or I don't want to spend the money. And the reality is by you not investing in your education, you're not going to grow as an agent. And if you're not growing, you're not getting more business. And if you're not getting the business, you're not going to make the money. So a small investment of a couple hundred dollars, one transaction, you get a $10,000 check. Like <laughs> You come back from that seminar and you are on fire and the first person you talk to can feel the passion that's coming out of your mouth because of what you just learned. 
that person's going to want to do business with you. I mean, because of my seminar in San Diego, I have a potential five listings that I've been working on because of that. All of that was happened because of Tom Ferry. It all happened. I can direct it right back to that. It came right back. They weren't ready to sell, but because of what I learned there, I stayed up, I followed up, I followed up, and now it's all starting to come to fruition. Five listings all in the same month. That's a good month. It's a really good month. Um, so, now with that said, when these listings, I have now made a system where I don't want the buyers. I want you guys to have the buyers. So when I get listings, it just means more activity for the company because I can't handle the buyers. So I'm distributing those leads back out to you guys. Every time a sign goes in the yard, be excited that the phones are gonna ring. Signs are the best, especially if Dave Hubble, the agent, gets a sign in the yard, then any representative in my company has a potential of the phone's gonna ring because I don't take those leads. Those are 100% distributed to the team. They're not mine. Um, repetitive touching, so staying in contact with your clients. I get that a lot of like, well, what do I call my clients about? What do I talk to them? You gotta get creative. I mean, these are, you can talk to them about a million things. Just you, the reason why you're not calling them is probably fear and you just need to get over that. Your fear that they're gonna hang up on you, fear that they don't wanna to talk to you, fear that you're bothering them, you need to get over that. Um, because unless your approach is extremely aggressive and you are being that guy that's just like pushing their will on them, then that's most likely they're not gonna to wanna to hear it. But if you're calling and genuinely reaching out just to touch base, ask them how things are going, haven't talked to you in a while, by the way, did you hear about what I, what's going on in my world? I'd like to hear about what's going on in yours. No one's going to hate that. They're, they might say, hey, I'm a little busy right now. Why don't we, uh, and that's where you're coming in and go, well, why don't I reach back out in a couple of days? Um, I definitely have something that uh, if I can take two minutes of your time and share with you, I'd appreciate that. Um, great. Like, kind of like what Noah just did. He got very candid and said, hey, I can't do my job efficiently through text messages. So unless we want to communicate, I can't help you. And the guy's like, whatever clicked in his head, but it made sense to him. I need help in this industry and uh, I'm about to not get the service that I need because I'm not returning calls. I better take the time. Uh, change your attitude. Before you leave, if you have a crappy attitude, don't even bother going out. <laughs> Seriously. If something is making you mad in your world and you go out prospecting with a chip on your shoulder, you might as well just tell the world, I don't want to do business with you. Don't do business with me. I'm a jerk. <laughs> don't do it. Uh, take time, look in the mirror and be like, hey, the affirmations, it's cheesy, but it works. Like build yourself up. Be proud about little things that you've done in your life to build that, that confidence booster that you need to go knock on 10 doors. And if you feel like you got a door slammed in your face or something that didn't go your way, take five minutes before you go to the next door and let it go. Like, just let it go. Hey, this person wants to talk to me. I'm glad I got a no because I'm going to get 10 of them. But on the 11th, I'm going to get that yes. It's that type of positive attitude because everything that you're thinking is hypothetical. It hasn't happened. It's, your, I call, it's called drunk monkeys. They're in there just talking in, in your head, just going to town, telling you why you're going to fail, why it's not going to work. You need to be aware when the drunk monkey is going off and you need to be like, oh, this is my drunk monkey. I need to shut it up. I need to stop it. Um, don't prospect with a poor attitude or just don't bother doing it at all. You, you need to be passionate, excited about what you're doing. Um, prospecting to the wrong people. Are you prospecting to people who identically, ident are you prospecting people that want to work with you? Are you prospecting to in a geographical area? Which means are you going to just neighborhoods as, as a prospect? Do you have a purpose of being there? Do you not have a purpose of being there? And if you don't, so sometime agents get to the point where they know what to work on transactions. I'm trying to think where you're going with this. And what they'll earn with their commissions per transaction. But they normally worked in the past. If that's true, you make sure prospecting people who will be closing the exact kind of transaction. Um, where are we going with that, Dad? <laughs> <laughs> what I get out of that is like you're not prospecting for the commission like if you're out there going 
I'm going to get this two and a half percent. That's the only reason I'm out here. It's, it's more towards the <clears throat> like, Okay. All right. Yeah. All right. You got to be able to recognize opportunity for what it is. Uh, I hate to pick on Linda, but we had um, our, our fun little lead issue today that just, we have a difference of opinion on what is considered lead and not. And I look at opportunity as opportunity. I look at opportunity as, is my time worth doing this? And if it is, how much time am I going to invest to make this happen? I don't think about, so a lead comes in and that person on the other end that had time to go on our website to make a phone call, whatever it is, that's the general public. That person has a need right now. If they're reaching out to me, they have a need, they need services. I might not be able to service this, per this person because it's not within my area. Just because it's not within my area, I look at that still as an opportunity for me to reach out and find the area that they're searching in and attach those two people together. But it's only worth 10 minutes of my time. That's the most that I will invest in that. So how can I streamline that and play the numbers and just get that done quickly, efficiently, and move on and not waste time trying to figure out if this is going to work or this, or do I like this person? And I think that's where me and Linda, if I'm, and correct me if I'm wrong, Linda, you know, she likes the leads that are, they are real true like this is a quality quality lead i feel comfortable giving this out because i put my name behind it going this is a quality lead um and this person is qualified and i've prepped them and i've worked with them and that's why i'm charging for what i'm charging am, well, am i yeah. i mean we have this discussion sometimes there's really a difference between a cold lead and a referral and a referral sure. exactly that handing them over and finding them a good agent to hand them over to that yeah. you vetted. You know, a cold lead, it's like, hey, here's a guy, it's like that's not the same as for her. Okay. And this is, I guess this is where the difference of opinion comes in that I make that the responsibility of the agent that I hand the lead over to. If if I'm general public and I'm looking online and they have good reviews and good this, great. You know, that buyer can go, I don't like that person. But again, it's only worth 10 minutes of my time because this is a cold lead. The lead came in, they had a question about a property. I don't service that area. I'm just going to filter that over and I'm going to call that agent and say, Hey, I have a lead that came into my website. I don't service the area. You do. Do you want it? 25%. Are you good with that? Now let's put, put yourself in, in their shoes. If you got a call from an agent in San Diego said, Hey, I got a lead that came in. They're asking property about Grover beach. I can't service that area. Are you good with that and pay you 25%? Linda as a business owner may say, no, that's, a, that's crap. I'll do it for 10. I'll do it for five because that's a cold lead. That's her negotiating her time and what she's worth. Other agents may go, I don't have any business right now. Yeah, I, I'd appreciate that I'll pay 25% all day long because I have no pipeline right now. And the fact that I got this lead is a big deal because I have nothing. So. Again, I don't know what's going on in their world. I'm just giving them an opportunity. They can choose whether they want it. If they don't want it, I'll go to the next agent. I'm not misleading or misguiding and saying, I got this hot, hot buyer. They're ready to close and write an offer tomorrow. Just tell them, I got a call from a buyer who has, I can't service. Can you service them? I typically charge 25% for my referrals. If they came back and said, oh, that man, so you really don't know this person? Nope. I'll do it for 10. Okay, that's my 10 minutes, it's worth it. I'll make 500 bucks, like cool, here you go. So, um, know what your time is worth and know to see opportunity when it's there. And if, if, if it's not the right opportunity for you, that's fine, but being able to recognize there is, our income is not always about buying or selling, sometimes it's just connecting people. And there is opportunity there and that is ultimately a portion of what your business can be. And there is a good source of business. Um, who is the local agent around here that just has a website and all he does is refer leads? You know who I'm talking about? 
It's bird. It is. Um, there is a gentleman that his business is developed around making websites, capturing leads, vetting his agents locally. So he has a network of agents. They already have a pre-done referral agreement. He has a distribution list. They're not in his brokerage. He's under another brokerage. The lead comes in and he just pushes them out. And the relationship for the referral is already there. And that's all he does. He doesn't sell. He doesn't take clients. He refers leads. Um, and he makes an income. He makes a living doing that because of his marketing online draws people into his business. So if our marketing online has a great exposure and I get leads from Chico or Reading, is that my fault that I am just capturing data? Because I have a license in California. So we are not just staying in our bubble. We are not just five cities. We are connecting people across California. Your bubble has gotten a lot bigger. So just know that and your mindset needs to be like that too because that's where there's a lot of business out there and it's not just happening right here. Um, prospecting to the wrong people, making sure that, you know, figure out your niche of what you want and if that's your niche, then you're going to prospect to that niche. Me as the owner of this brokerage and pushing you guys, I'm going to want to open your mindset up to be like Reading to San Diego. <laughs> that's our niche. Those are, that's our target people right there. Um, we have a California license. I say we use it. Matrix launched. We have access at our fingertips now. You can get as much data as you need to be able to connect people in different cities. There is a big opportunity. There's a big business there. You get a paid referral. I do not recommend that you go to a territory that you don't know and say, I am a specialist in this territory. And you try to sell in Chico and say, I know this, this local area. No, that would be a disservice to the client. But you can definitely say, if the client reaches out to you and trusts you, that's worth your time to say, my client is moving to Chico. I better take my time and go through. And this is, again, recognizing opportunity for what it is. This client 100% wants to get your recommendation or do you just need to connect people together because it came in as an internet lead? So there is a difference there. If I had a client that called me and said, I'm moving to Medford, Oregon, which is happening, I'm gonna take my time, I'm gonna find that agent, I'm gonna reach out to that agent, I'm gonna interview the agent. And I'm gonna give her three choices of agents that I want her to go interview as well. Because that's a client asking for this. This person's just saying, I, I want to get into a property. Well, I'm going to tie in with an agent and let that agent do their job on selling themselves. Um, but I'll make sure I explain that to the agent that this is not a preferred client of mine. This is someone that just wants information about a property. Are you good with taking this? I charge 25% for the lead. It's almost like a relocations company. They took 40% out of one of our agents checks, a relocations company. No different person's moving to your area wants information about your, uh, your relocate, you know, your territory. Do you want this lead? It's 40%. It's like, ah, uh, no, <laughs> and that's a big hit. You know, it was like $9,000 for that lead. That's a big hit. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's a $9,000 referral. It's a $9,000 paycheck because she connected people together. Um, so I don't know if you could hear because the microphones. Oh, by the way, we have microphones coming and our whole web equipment got ordered. So it should be here today, tomorrow, which is going to be cool. Um, what she's saying, she connected people together and now she's getting, I, yes. So, and just because they're leaving out of state does not mean that you cannot collect a referral out of state. It means you can't do business over there, but they can send you compensation. So, hey, I got a client moving to Texas. Great, let me call a Texas agent. 
I will vet them for you and I'll give you three recommendations. Um, it doesn't cost you anything. If you like my recommendations, let me know that you've cho chosen that agent so I can um, you know, basically and watch it. She gets 30% of the clock. Yep. So if it's two and a half percent, this. So those are called referral fees. They're referral agreements, they're in zip forms. It is a portion of this business that sometimes you miss opportunity because you don't think outside the box. That this is a potential opportunity where I can connect people and make 25%, 30%, 15%. It is all negotiable. Standard in our, would you say California or just in our community? Um, I think standard customer might be a referral for my brother. It's 25 cents. So 25% is a very standard referral fee. Um, the, what's that? 20% Okay, so 20%, 25, 30 is, it is negotiable. If, if I have a client that is ready to write an offer in Texas, I'm going to push for 30, 35. Here is a business. Here is $10,000. You're going to pay me three grand. Like I'm giving you 10 grand right now. You don't even have to work. You have to write and facilitate the transaction. You're going to pay a higher premium for that. So again, knowing what it's worth is a big deal. Um, and agents on that end, would you pay 20 bucks to make 100? If somebody said, I'm gonna, you're going to give me 20 bucks, I'm going to give you $100, would you argue that? No. Oh. So hey, here's 10 grand, but you're going to pay me three grand. Well, that's not normal. Well, neither is handing over 10 grand. So <laughs> um, discounting your prospecting once you generate activity this is the one biggest most common mistake and agents make to the best they can do in real estate career you need to prospect constantly so you're out there you go farming you spend some money on postcards you not door knocked and you got three leads and you're like cool and then you're done that is not following through with the farm once you pick a farm you need to consistently go to your farm you need to consistently grow your farm think of a farm they call it a farm because you're planting seeds then it grows and then you go and you pick your 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 money you pick your homes well this guy's ready to sell now and then next season starts and now you have a new crop of people that are ready to sell but you're out there like a farmer planting your seeds and watering that farm to grow those people to grow the relationship that when they're ready to sell when that harvest comes today they're thinking of you as the farmer that's Farmer, I mean, that acknowledge, 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 analogy, 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 I, I mean, I see that in my head when I'm looking at neighborhoods. Oh, this is a, an untouched farm right now. Oh man, there's a lot of farmers out here. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but look at me, I got a big machine coming through and you know, I do it more efficiently. Like, I, I, you gotta think like that. Don't delude yourself about this. Um, real quick, does anybody know how to pick a farm? What's a good way to pick a farm? Okay. Why would you go for Sam? And why is that important? Farming in an area that has more turnover. Whether that's the correct way, but statistically, you can go into it's called My First AM. You can pick a geographical farm, and once you highlight the area that you're looking at, it's going to tell you this percentage of how many homes that you've highlighted versus how many homes have sold. And I think it does it in a year. Actually, Stacey Axon is going to be talking to one of our guys. Yes, she is. So Stacey Axon from First American is going to come and she will actually show how to geographically pick a farm. Now, if you're picking a farm that has a one to 2% return rate, that means that it's going to take you a lot longer to get a return on your on your time but what if that return rate is 1.5 million then from that farm how many are really dedicated to working that farm who's your competition those are things that you really need to know moving forward if you're about to invest money into farming you want to know who's the competition now if it has a high return rate you're gonna have a lot of competition but there's a lot of inventory there so you can strike gold a little bit sooner than something that doesn't have as, as high of a return rate. 
<clears throat> but it better mean that what are you doing to be the yellow pants in the room? If you're going into a territory that has seven agents and they're already prospecting and farming, what are you doing differently? Are, is your marketing campaign the same as theirs? Are you giving the same data as they are? Are you gonna do it more efficiently? Are you gonna do it more frequently? Are you gonna do it with a better attitude? All these things come into factor because one slip up when you're in that farm and your attitude sucks, you've just ruined your farm, you've killed your crop. And now this agent comes over with a good attitude and they're, they're, they're confident about selling your home and they have just now taken over that farm. And it's gonna take you a very long time to break back in and change the mindset of your prospect because you had one bad attitude that day. So that's knowing that you're in the game when you're stepping out into that world. Like you're in your game. Um, so my first AM, great tool to be able to pick farms. And then once you pick the farm, you can get a very clear picture of who's, who you're up against. What is the percentage that you're typically looking for, for a good farm? It's about five to six. You, st you find a five, six, that's a good farm. You find low, like one, two, three, just know that your time is gonna take a while to break into that category. You know, not many homes come on the market in this territory, so it's gonna take some time. So then you're balancing out higher revenue, you know, one sale, $30,000 every six months, or one sale a month at $8,000. You know, these are the things that you're thinking about when you're, when you're picking. Um, so key takeaways from this lesson, the process we've reviewed during this lesson is give you powerful to sell almost anything. If it's got a roof, you can sell it. Okay. <laughs> Or even if it doesn't have a roof, <laughs> it doesn't have a roof. You can sell it. Uh, commercial, residential, property management. These are all opportunities that you have at your fingertips at this brokerage. You're not limited over here to do stuff. Spread your wings, get creative. I'm not going to clip your wings. I want you to get out there and do. You're able to go outside of the box over here. That's where you can take on your competition and do things differently. Um, the people in an organization you meet in these criteria are qualified prospects. So, uh, before making a sale call, it's important to do your homework. It's important to do your homework with time sensitive. It is not important to go and do all your research about one phone call you're about to make that takes you 15 minutes to do your research because you're, you're, you're stopping yourself from making the call because you're just scared to do it. So you're finding excuses on why you don't want to make the call. At the end of the day, make the call. Because by making the call, you might fumble with your words, but the next call you make, you won't fumble again. You can't be so prepared that you are over prepared and then you just don't do the work. You really have to push yourself to say, it's my drunk monkey telling me I'm gonna fail at this call. I don't care, I'm gonna do it anyway. And if I fail, I'm happy that I failed because I'm going to learn something from it and I'm going to do it again. You can't stop progress because you're scared. You have to talk to people in this industry. You have to. Like, or go find a job. Like, there's no other way around it. This is a contact sport. Um, your research preparation pays off during the presentation. So Ben's about to do a listing presentation. This is preparing for the listing presentation is valuable for his time because he is about to go to the show and he needs to be on his A game to do that. But starting to figure out how long does it take for me to prepare? That preparation take, should take you no more than two and a half to three hours at max. If it takes you a week, you need to speed that up. That's why I've been said, hey, that's why I told you, make the appointment and come see me two hours before. That's all the time we need to prep. Anything more than that, now that you have some downtime is the time to get your systems in place. So when that call comes in and you're ready for that, you got everything lined up and all you're doing is practicing your listing presentation. If you don't feel confident to give a listing presentation yet, there is a listing presentation in here. I have it on video. Jump ahead to lesson five and start learning that too. Your listing presentation is your moneymaker. I mean, that is why you're getting, the moment you get a listing, you're getting five deals because of it. You're gonna get phone calls from buyers. You're gonna get neighbors calling you that potentially wanna list their home. Uh, what else do we get? 
referrals from the seller once you sell. Um, boom, they move to the next one. Family, I mean, the reason why you wanna get listings is not because I got a listing, it's because it, it starts a flood of other potential business and it opens up. Like you close with the buyer, you're pretty much done. You took that buyer around, you found them a property, they're done. You get a listing, all of a sudden your phone is ringing, you have potential people to talk to about other properties. If they don't like this one, you're, you're asking for referrals. I mean, there's just so much avenues you can take it when you get a listing and you get to put the sign in the ground, which gives you the exposure. So listings are so key. The, being a listing agent should be a priority in your business because that is the moment you get a listing, it's like a guaranteed paycheck. If you got a good listing, you can guarantee that I'm going to get a paycheck because of this, especially in this market right now. It's hot. So list, what is it? List to lust. I've never heard that. Okay. Gotcha. Um, and we don't take listings to sit. We take listings to sell. So that's why you can leave going, ha ha, I got a big check. Woo. Um, keep your emotions under check because it's not done till it's done. Definitely don't spend the money till it's done. Don't spend it in your head. Don't spend it in your head. Um, sure. My story, we had to use a split of desk in the office. Me and Alex, we both do these. And we're both, we need that first commission check for that because it's been a while. And we both get in an escrow and uh, we're about ready to close the same time. And so I think he just come off and go for it. Everything I was looking for. And I'm in the front, he's in the back, and I hear this. In the back, I hear this. No, really? Are oh, you kidding, right? I'm trying to ease off and hands up. And, and what happened? The house burned down. It was supposed to close, like, I think maybe it was a Friday and they were going to record Monday or something. Yeah. yeah. What happens? <laughs> yeah. I had a levy break on a property I flipped. And I had just done remodeling, just done. We're going on market. I'm all excited. We're about a week on the market in Merced. Levy breaks, goes two and a half feet throughout the house. Water's flooded. I got to spend another 20 grand to rip the drywall out and replace it. Ah, oh, shoot. There goes my profit. Happens. Remember that one? That was a fun one. The pool got clean, though. <laughs> I just got the pool clean, replastered. Nice new, <laughs> washed out really good. Uh, embrace others. Okay, so diversify in real estate, create comfort through actions and learning skills. So embrace others' differences, show sensitivity to others, be positive with all. So it just, you know, this isn't the, this, uh, yeah, I, was, I met a lady today and she's having to move out. And so I'm sensitive to the fact that, hey, you're getting a 60 day notice. Um, so when I talk to my owner, I said, maybe we might consider doing a cash for keys or relocation, um, which could entice her to move out a little sooner than later, which is a benefit to us. But I can, you can tell that she's going to need some assistance. And I can assure you that when we sell, I'll be able to recoup that 1500 bucks on the sale portion because this is going to be a hot property. And we already have a line of people. And she goes, and the lady's been there for almost 12 years. So it's like, she's going to need some assistance to help move on because this is a... I know the loss of 60 days, but the reality is some people need that. Be, caught, be aware of your surroundings and sometimes that little bit of, even if it was $500, that little bit of assistance will, will show goodwill that, hey, and I get the property a lot sooner, which means I can put money in your pocket 30 days quicker. Is there value there? Um, attitudes, communication skills. Um, don't take this business personal. And it's very hard to do. Somebody rubs you the wrong way, they disrespect. You feel disrespected and all of a sudden you're pissed and you're like, screw you. I'm not gonna do business with you and da 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 And this person's a jerk. Like, you need to stop, take yourself out of the situation, take a breath and just know that there's something going on in their world that has nothing to do with you. Don't let that affect your attitude because you can turn around, run into that person who's gonna be your next million dollar client and you're pissed because of what just happened over here because you let it affect you. You let it affect you. Say no, be like, I, you know what, I'm not gonna accept that. Thank you, but no thank you, I'm not gonna accept that. 
and that's it. And I've, you've got to put blockers up because you can't get baited. I call it baiting. That's what it is. You get trolled online. You get baited. People talk stuff about you. Let it go. You're going to make people mad in this business. There's no way around it. You're going to have conflict. Half our business is conflict because you've got two parties trying to negotiate what's better for this person. I'm very strong-willed, very strong egoed agents that are very confident in their ability. I'm going to come over the top and then it's, it, it escalates very, very quickly. And really good agents can see that and go, we're, we're not going to get anywhere in this. At this point, we just need to agree to disagree. Let's come back to this and let's go on to another topic that we can agree on. So you have to start learning how to control your emotions because that's why they hired you. Because if your emotions are out of, out of whack and you're constantly going to your client, telling them how bad this other agent is, it's just going to make your client irrational as well and not an emotional mess too. And then now you both are attacking this agent and they're attacking you and nothing is getting accomplished. Um, see right there. <laughs> what did I end up getting? Yeah. <laughs> um, I think I did an apology online. Oh, is that what it was? Okay. Talk to my wife. She gets that. She gets, my wife does that stuff. There you go. I think I took it to that level. Forget a bottle of wine. Let's go wine tasting. Um, crossing lake. So be, oh, here, uh, train yourself to respect and understand nonverbal communication when you're sitting with your client. Right there is a very aggressive nonverbal communication. Just boom. You want, yeah. <laughs> but if you're, if you're trying to pull, if you're trying to pull information from the client, and you're sitting back in your chair like this, and you're asking some questions, they're going to feel compelled to not respond openly with you. So leaning in, kind of putting some elbow in, really making the eye contact, talking, it means that I'm engaging you right now. Talk to me. Let me hear what you're saying. Um, if I get everybody in the audience and they're starting to do this, it means that what I'm saying is off topic and no one really cares what I'm saying. That's what's going on in my head. Those are my drunk monkeys. So nonverbal communication. <laughs> there you go. You know, you Yeah, there you go. So as a good way of communication is saying, hey, am I you know asking questions such as is does this make sense or do you have any questions? Is this something that is a topic, a good topic for you? Um, because then I gotta get my drunk monkey under control and be like, no, it's it's his back. Cool. Now I can also log that. Like he's got some back things. So maybe when we look for other properties, I'll something I'll look for a property with stairs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Literally categorizing people for what type of property would be best for them. Well, have to break it fix it up. Yeah. Like maybe a remodel isn't the best because he's, he's, you know, if he's like, hold on, I'm getting out of the car. I have a client that's got a cane and they're just like, we are not going to look at fixers. <laughs> he might say he wants a fixer. He doesn't want a fixer. Like, let's stay away from that. No stairs. Uh, we had a house that had a uh, electric cart that went up. Dude, that was kind of cool. Uh, making eye contact, face, uh, irregular speech, impatient. Uh, I get that a lot. We are very A type personality. Go, 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 go. And you get a client that's very just mellow. You need to mirror your client. They are not going to mirror you. You need to mirror them which means slow down, listen. Maybe we have to take one step at a time. Even my voice will start to slow. Everything in here will start to slow if that's the type. And as I take control of the conversation, they're engaging with me, I can slowly start picking up my tempo as they're following along. So you're watching the body language to see if you have that, it means that you are in control of the conversation. And if you're in control of the conversation, you can take the conversation any direction you want. And ultimately, we're taking it to, let's set an appointment. Are we ready to list this property? Do you have any questions? Great. You know, let's go. Let's do this. Um, all right. I'm probably going to lose you guys or lose this. If my computer dies, sorry, we're getting another computer by next training, and we're just going to go. Uh, fair housing. Let's make sure we stay within the law. Fair Housing Act is a federally act in the United States intending to protect buyers or renters of dwellings from sellers or landlords in discrimination. 
you can't go into Santa Maria and be like, oh, Santa Maria has a high population of Hispanic people, so let's put all Hispanic people over in Santa Maria. Totally a violation, okay? You cannot do that. So you cannot even mention that with the seller. Hey, we're gonna, we're gonna just market to the Hispanic population. No, we're not. We're gonna market to general public. That's what fair housing is. You cannot discriminate. Uh, you cannot discriminate on age unless the association is the one that's enforcing that. You have to follow the rules, but you can't discriminate age, sex, religion, uh, gender. I mean, it's just, you, you got it right here. Race, color, religion, sex, handicap, the national orientation. Um, so make sure it's considered redlining, steering, and blockbusting. That is basically like identifying a certain neighborhood and only putting certain people in that neighborhood. Um, you, that client can ultimately be, or even a neighbor can complain on you and, and that's a clear violation. So be careful about that. It's just a client is a client. 